In 1907, the citrus growers of Southern California made a trip north. They were looking for timber and milling facilities. They needed boxes. They didn't travel by air in those days, but this is the route followed. Up out of the palm tree country to the pines that begin a hundred miles or so south of Mount Lassen. There had been an earthquake and fire in San Francisco in 1906, and the rebuilding of the city made a greater demand for lumber of all kinds than had ever existed before. The citrus growers suddenly found themselves unable to buy enough boxes. It became evident that the grower must provide himself with an adequate supply of boxes at reasonable cost. To handle this problem and others, members of the California Fruit Growers Exchange organized Fruit Growers Supply Company in 1907. They went on north, passing the volcanic cone of Bernie Mountain and Mount Shasta, looking for timber and a mill to make the boxes for themselves. It was a long trip and they had time to analyze their problem. It was a simple case of supply and demand. Lumber had become scarce. Box prices were being exploited. The grower's dollar would go about half as far in buying boxes as before. Just south of the Oregon border, they found the town of Hilt, where there was a sawmill and a box factory. That mill and factory had small but adequate capacity. For the time being, the problem was solved. The value of the grower's money in boxes was returned to normal relationship. However, citrus production more than doubled within the next 10 years. And another crisis came with World War I. Inadequate supplies and rocketing prices again forced supply company members to seek additional protection on box supply. In 1919, they purchased 41,000 acres of standing timber in Lassen County and erected a sawmill and box factory at Susanville. The Susanville plant was built with excess capacity for protecting box supply. But again the doubling of citrus production and a second world war brought a third crisis. Supply was reduced and prices increased. Members' timber reserves were nearly depleted and to continue adequate protection it was necessary to replenish timber reserves and increase the capacity to produce box shook. In 1944, the supply company bought additional timberlands in Plumas, Lassen, and Shasta counties. Also, a sawmill and large box factory at Westwood, 23 miles west of Susanville. Along with this came the town of Westwood, with a population of some 4,000 people. In the western pine areas, man has destructive competition in harvesting timber. Logging accounts for only about 50% of the annual depletion of this timber. Fire destroys part of the rest, but insects, though not as spectacular as fire, are even more destructive. This is where we find one of the killers, the pine beetle. Pine beetles work under the bark of the tree. They tunnel around through the cambium layer and literally cause the tree to starve to death. Other species of trees have different insect killers just as deadly. The old mature trees, having lost their vigor, are most susceptible to destruction by beetles. Standing dead trees or snags are serious fire hazards. Struck by lightning, they often catch fire and become the source of wind-blown embers scattering fire through the forest. These snags usually have no value for lumber. To dispose of snags by hand is not economical, so the snag pusher was developed to fell these potential torches to the ground and eliminate the fire hazard.
the snag must be nudged until it falls. Each time the snag pusher retreats for another thrust, the tree sways and dead branches sometimes snap and fall to earth. The driver of the snag pusher is protected by a metal cage. The pine trees now being logged are 250 to 300 years old. The ponderosa pine is the preferred tree for box shook. This one is approximately 275 years old. You can recognize the mature ponderosa pine by the reddish plates of its bark, shaped like those on the shell of a turtle. The ponderosa pine needles are long and slender. And although ponderosa means big, its cones barely fill a man's hand. The sugar pine was named by early settlers who, noticing its heavy flow of pitch, were reminded of the sugar maple. The ponderosa pine and the sugar pine are collectively the most important source of box shook. The sugar pine needles are shorter than those of the ponderosa but the cones are the largest of all commercial pines. The second most important source of box shook is the white fir. Many people call this tree silver tip because of the silver white cast of its needles. You'll never find fir cones on the ground. They disintegrate on the branches and drop their seeds near the base of the tree. The Douglas fir is the third most important tree on company lands. The firs must be used more and more for box shook as the pines are logged out. The logging of mature trees is actually beneficial to the forest. Their removal reduces the competition for light and moisture for the remaining trees, thus promoting more rapid growth. Now to the making of a citrus box. First, the hand fallers start the undercut with a saw. It is then enlarged by chopping a V in the trunk using the saw cut as the guide. This cut determines the direction in which the tree will fall. The opposite side is then sawed through and the tree falls in the predetermined direction. The more modern method is with a gasoline or an electric chain saw, which eliminates chopping entirely. This is a gasoline-powered saw. The procedure is the same, and so is the end result. Lumber from this tree will make enough boxes to ship slightly more than one carload of citrus fruit which means that the California-Arizona citrus industry will require more than 100,000 of these giants in a single year. After the tree has been felled, the trunk is limbed. Then the trunk is sawed or bucked into logs of 32-foot length. An experienced man can buck enough logs in a day to make 9,000 citrus boxes. Now to get the log out of the woods. A cable called a choker is slipped around the end of a log. The choker is fastened by slipping the button into the catch. Where ground permits, tractor-drawn logging arches are pulled into position adjacent to the logs. The choker is then attached to a cable running over the logging arch to a winch at the rear of the tractor. As the chokers are pulled, they draw the logs together and lift the ends clear of the ground. In this position, the logs are skidded to the loading landing where empty trucks are ready to receive them.
Each truck carries its own trailer piggyback until it is lifted to the ground by the loader or jammer. Then the trailer is attached to the truck and the unit is ready to receive logs. The logs are lifted by wire ropes which have a bell hook at the end that grips the log in the same manner that ice tongs grip a piece of ice. The loader places each log with individual care so as to prevent shifting of the load. When properly loaded, these trucks on private roads can carry 12,000 board feet or enough logs to make 3,000 citrus boxes. Logs weigh 8 to 12 pounds per board foot. Many factors must be considered when determining the most economical method of transporting logs to the mill. The volume and density of timber stand, the nature of the site, the amount of snow and rainfall, and the distance to the mill. In some areas, both trucks and railroads are used. Here, logs are being trucked to a railhead, where a steam-operated jammer picks the logs up and swings them on to the rail cars. Heavier logs are loaded first to ensure a balanced load. The supply company has over 75 miles of railroad, nine locomotives, and more than 300 logging cars. The hilt operation goes back to the days when logs were skidded by oxen or horses to a well-greased wooden slide. Timber was closer to the mill in those days, but as trees were cut farther from the mill site, caterpillar tractors, railroads, and trucks replaced oxen, horses, and slides. These cats skid logs down grades exceeding 45 degrees. In such terrain, logging arches are less useful than on flatter ground. Loading landings carved from the steep sides of the Siskiyous must of necessity be small in area and are consequently congested. It takes a lot of power and brakes to bring over 40 tons of logs down these mountain roads. Drivers must be cautious. Curves are sharp and downgrades run as high as 20%. This is only the beginning. It is 25 miles to Wairika. Fruit Grower Supply Company owns more than 50 trucks devoted entirely to hauling logs. Each year, these trucks transport over 100 million board feet. Because the season for truck logging is normally from late May to late November, company roads must be kept in tip-top condition to permit maximum usage during that period. As the logging operation is expanded, so is the network of company roads. The bulldozer is used to cut roads through to the new track. At present, more than 100 miles of company roads are in use. Twice a day, the main roads are wet down to reduce dust and pack the surface. When the loaded truck reaches Wairika, the logs are dumped and rolled to waiting rail cars. They are carefully loaded on the cars for the 26-mile trip to Hilt. When the logs arrive at the mill, they are stored in the log pond. Here a giant arm pushes them from the car into the water. Another method for dumping logs is by use of wire ropes which are run under the loads. A crane pulls the wire ropes and the logs roll into the pond. Because it is not economical to log during the winter months at these operations, logs must be accumulated during the open months. The company's three mill ponds hold more than 30 million board feet. When the ponds are full, additional logs are decked nearby. The logs from the mill ponds are guided into a chute called the log slip, where an endless chain pulls them into the sawmill, passing the drag saw. The drag saw located on the log deck quickly bucks the logs into 16-foot length. 
These are measured or scaled and the board foot content recorded. Each log is pushed from the slip to the log deck and temporarily stored according to its diameter in front of the proper saw. Then the log is rolled onto the saw carriage where mechanical hands turn and adjust it to proper position. The saw carriage moves back and forth, each trip forward carrying the log through a band saw or head rig to cut off a board. The sawyer studies the surface of the log and directs the sawing to produce the optimum lumber footage. Here the sawyer is signaling to the setter for an inch and a half or six quarter board. The setter rides the carriage and with his controls, he only adjusts the log for changes in thickness as the sawyer directs by hand signal. The off-bearer places the boards on a conveyor line. Now the sawyer is signaling that he will turn the log down. A large steam-operated hook, which is controlled by the sawyer, makes the turn. To obtain economical production, boards are cut in multiple thickness on the head rig whenever possible. Here the sawyer again is signaling that he will turn the log. The better grades of lumber come from the outer portions of the log. The sawyer directs the cutting to obtain the maximum high-grade footage. In eight hours, this head rig will cut enough lumber to make more than 20,000 citrus boxes. Here he is turning the log for the fourth time, squaring it up, completing the cycle of outside cuts. The balance of the log, or cant, is now turned down for boards 12 inches wide to be used in making orange box ends and centers. Here they are cut 3 inches thick and will go to the resaw. The operation is continued until the log is completely sawed into boards. Every four hours, the huge band saws are changed. The dull saws are moved to the filing room, where they are placed in automatic grinders and sharpened. It takes only four minutes to change this 52-foot band saw. The boards with bark edges move over rollers to the edger. They are fed into the edger a board at a time. The operator sets circular saws to rip the bark from the board. Those boards coming from the head rig in multiple thickness are re-sawed by this horizontal band saw into thinner boards. Not all boards cover the same route through the mill. Let us see how many ways the boards from a log may be channeled. From the log pond, each log enters the mill in the log slip. After being cut into 16-foot lengths, it moves across the log deck and then onto the saw carriage. The carriage forces it into the band saw, which cuts off a board at a time. Those cuts having bark are rooted to the edger. The bark is ripped off, and if the board is in single thickness, it goes directly to the trimmer saws. Boards in multiple thickness are rooted to the resaw and cut into thinner boards. Then they move on to the trimmer saws. As the log is sawed up, boards without bark are developed, so they bypass the edger. 
Such boards in multiple thickness are directed to the resaw before going to the trimmer saws. Boards in merchantable thickness and having no bark move directly to the trimmer saws, bypassing both the edger and the resaw. The boards move on to the trimmer saws, where they are trimmed to standard length and where the undesirable portions are cut out. They pass under a row of spinning circular saws, each of which can be raised or lowered individually by the operator. As the boards move along below him, he drops the proper combination of saws to remove the unwanted portions. When the boards leave the trimmer saws, another operator places on a conveyor the strips and edgings having value for making car strips or lath. This wide conveyor is called the green chain because it carries the green lumber as it moves out of the sawmill. The lumber is graded and sorted as it moves along. At Hilt, after being piled in small units, all lumber is air dried. It is transported to and from the open drying yard by fork-nosed lift trucks. At Susanville, the green lumber which is to be air dried is piled on tram cars from the green chain and moved to the yard, where the method of piling employs a machine known as the Hilke Piler. All green lumber is piled with stickers between layers to permit the circulation of air. It takes two and a half of these piles to make one carload of citrus shook. At Westwood, a hammerhead crane picks up the boards as they come from the green chain and carries them to the stacker house. In the stacker house, the green boards are piled on kiln trucks with stickers between the layers to permit circulation of warm air. The kilns at Westwood and Susanville operate at 125 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, drying the lumber in from three to 10 days, depending on the species and thickness. For instance, six quarter or inch and a half ponderosa pine boards take six days. When dry, lumber is moved from the kilns on electrically operated transfer cars. The bed of these transfer cars has tracks so that the tram car may be rolled on and off in much the same way that freight cars roll on and off a ferry. In good drying weather, six-quarter ponderosa pine boards require 60 days for drying in the yard. The dry lumber is unpiled in this manner onto tram cars, which carry it to points for further refining. Boards for shook manufacture are surfaced on all sides. Here they are fed into a planer at the rate of 300 lineal feet a minute. This lumber coming from the planer is ripped to proper width for orange box slats. Then it is piled in units and transported to the box factory and set on powered floor chains to feed the cutoff line. As the cutoff man uses up one unit of lumber, he merely pushes a button and a second unit is moved into position. Here the cutoff sawyer is sawing 12 inch boards into cuts for orange box ends and centers. The usable pieces pass over a roller to a conveyor. The waste pieces fall through to a waste conveyor and become fuel. Orange box slats are cut from five inch stock. The cutoff sawyer moves the board against a metal stop to measure the proper length and then pushes the board into the saw. Defects must be placed where they will not interfere with nailing or must be cut out as waste. The useful pieces are sorted and stacked by tail-off. 
There are 44 of these cutoff saws in the supply company's three box factories. They cut up enough lumber per eight hour a day for over 100,000 citrus boxes. The slat blocks are nearly one and one half inches thick and must be put through slat resaws. When fed into the line of slat resaws, the edges are rounded by knives on a head rotating at 8,000 revolutions per minute. Then the block passes through four band saws set up in tandem to emerge as five separate slats. Box ends and centers are also run through band resaws, where each block is sawed into two equal thicknesses. There are 21 band resaws in the three box factories. Material is fed through box factory resaws at about 125 lineal feet a minute. Pieces too large to waste and too small to use as is are segregated at the cutoff line and then cut and matched up at the push rip saws to make glued or splined box ends. Matched sets are fed into the splining machine, which cuts grooves into the end grain, applies glue in the grooves, and then inserts splines or strips of wood which fit the grooves. This machine makes 100 to 140 box ends a minute. As the box ends come from the spliner, they are still in double thickness and thus are re-sawn to proper thickness. Shook containing loose knots or minor checks or splits is stapled to prevent further splitting and to make the knots fast. Shook is conveyed from various resaws to a machine which ties it in bundles. Sawdust, shavings and other waste from the plant operations are carried by blowers and conveyors from the plant to a huge fuel pile. A tractor works constantly on top of the pile to keep the fuel distributed. From this fuel, steam is produced for electric generators, dry kilns, and other purposes. Now let's see how box covers are made. Short logs called bolts are lowered into the barker. A chuck on each end of the bolt digs into the soft, wet wood and grips the bolt firmly. Then a head containing many knife blades is brought into contact with the surface of the log. As the knives rotate, the bark is cut from the bolt, leaving a clean surface. After the bark has been removed, the bolt is placed in a lathe where a sharp blade peels off a thin sheet of veneer. Other blades trim and cut it to cover slat length. It looks like a large roll of paper unwinding. As the bolt gets smaller, more knots appear, showing the places from which branches grew when the tree was younger. The veneer is clipped into cover slat widths. Since the veneer is still wet, it works easily. The slats are inspected for defects. Then the cover slats are put through a rounder, which rounds both edges of 300 slats per minute. The end pieces to which slats are fastened are called cleats. In this machine, a blanker, they are cut to size. The cleats are fed into a giant sewing machine or stitcher along with the slats and are literally stitched together with steel wire to form the covers. This machine will stitch over 2,000 covers an hour. The completed covers are still wet, so they are put through the kiln and dried for 16 to 18 hours. Ever wonder how that familiar word sun-kissed is put on the covers? Well, here's the answer. They're run through a printing press that does the job. The finished covers are bundled and tied with wire straps for shipment. Back home again in the familiar surroundings of the packing house, Shook is unloaded and then made into boxes in machines at the rate of close to 10 boxes a minute.
But each box represents more than just boards and nails. It is the result of the combined effects of many factors, the intelligent selection of trees from the forest. Logged and transported on trucks and railroads to storage ponds and stockpiles. Men and machines transforming logs into usable lumber by sawing, edging, trimming, drying, storing. Then planing, cutting, rounding, working the boards into box shook. Over 2,000 men and women working to convert trees into parts for boxes in order to provide safe delivery of the citrus fruits resulting from the tireless efforts of more than 14,000 sun-kissed growers. To ensure an adequate supply of suitable containers at reasonable cost, these growers have provided themselves with thousands of acres of timberland and with sawmills and box factories capable of producing 40 million boxes annually, if needed. Through their cooperative achievement, these people and their plants make it possible to supply half a million dealers throughout the United States and Canada with the finest of citrus fruits, carefully packed in the best of containers.